No, I'm Enrique Martinez Meyer. I'm a professor at the National University of Mexico, the Institute of Biology, Mexico City. And for me, it's a great pleasure to be here participating in this uh, Ecological Niche Modeling Online course 2020. Thank you, Town, for organizing this, and thank you also for for having invited me to participate in it. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about one of the most popular applications of ecological niche modeling and one of the hardest topic, literally speaking, uh, in the world, which is climate change. Every month, dozens of uh, scientific papers are published in different ways of, of using ecological niche modeling to understand better how species respond to climate change. Many, many of them are uh, future projections to uh, oversee what uh, the potential responses of species uh, could be. Many others are uh, projections to the past to see how species have responded to previous climate, uh, climatic changes. So it's a very active and exciting field and uh, because it raises so uh, high interest it's uh, also uh, a lot of, of I would say abuse or misuse of, of ecological niche models for uh, climate change biology uh, studies. So uh, in this talk I will um, present you some basic information on climate change, also some basic information on, on species responses to climate change, and then I will go to how ecological niche models are, are being used for uh, investigating uh, the effects of climate change on biodiversity. I hope you enjoy uh, this, this talk. This is uh, more a conceptual uh, talk. There will be a, a future delivery in, in more practical uh, and the more practical side of of, of this uh, topic. So I I also hope that uh, awake you some uh, curiosity and some doubts and uh, interest in, in in this general topic. Well, let me. Let me go with, with the presentation. Le I, I want to start with uh, very basic concepts in, in climate change and to understand or, or explain what is and also what is not climate change. And in this sense, there are two important concepts that, that we have to understand. What is climate variability and what is climate change? Climate variability refers to variation in the mean state or other statistics such as standard deviation of, of uh, the climate in uh, short-term uh, temporal scales. It could be from, from days to weeks to months or even to, to few years, whereas climate change refers to changes in the state of, of the climate in the same uh, parameters as, as uh, you, you um, measured in, in this climate variability, but uh, in long, longer terms, in temporal terms, in, instead of, of a few years, there are decades or centuries or even millennia. In this, in this uh, graphic, in, in to the right, you can see this uh, illustration. Uh, imagine this is one uh, climatic parameter, let's say temperature, and uh, this is a temporal scale here in the x-axis, and, and you can see these ups and downs let's think that these are, are years. So one year 
the maximum temperature is here, the, well, the highest mean temperature is here. And the next year is, is slow, and then up, and then down, and so forth. Well, you can see some years with, with uh, very extreme uh, values to the high end or to the low end. And this is like uh, the normal behavior of climate. It's very variable with hot years, with cold, cold years. But this doesn't mean that it's climate change. If we see this, uh, the behavior of this uh, variation in many years, we can draw a line to see how the tendency is. And then if we see changes in this uh, tendency line, we can talk about climate change. So uh, this red line refers to these long-term changes. In this case, you can see that it's an increasing trend. So uh, in this case, if we are talking about mean temperature, we can say that we are looking at a, at a warming uh, trend. Okay. Well, climate is a, is a very, very complex uh, uh, phenomenon. So uh, because it's so variable, it's very difficult to attribute individual extreme events to, to climate change. It's tempting, for example, nowadays that Australia is having these terrible uh, wildfires to, to be sure that this is a consequence of climate change. Uh, it's not a direct cause-effect uh, relationship. It's a complex system, so it's it's not that easy to attribute directly to climate change many of the of the extreme events that we observe. But if we see this in the long term. Uh, for example, uh, this analysis in which we can see that some events have become become more frequent in, in recent years. For example, here, meteorological events in green, you can see these bars represent the frequency that in, in, in the most recent years, these bars are higher, which means that they are more frequent. Same as the hydrological events these uh, blue bars, you can see that they are larger in, in the most recent years, which means that uh, because we know that, that uh, temperature has been rising in the long term, it's a climate change, it's a warming uh, event. As, as the planet becomes warmer and warmer, this events become more frequent. Uh, but uh, because this complexity, it is very difficult to predict the behavior of the climate. Uh, this is, here is another important uh, term, weather, the difference between weather and climate. And weather refers to the the state of of the climate in in a single day or in, in in nearby days, whereas climate refers to the general state of of uh, the climate. So uh, we have been good and we have improved in predict the weather for the next few days and we can have high certainty of, of uh, uh, some weather events with one, two, three, uh, almost uh, five days in advance. 
but uh, to predict uh, the climate this is a different business and it's much more difficult to to predict like intermediate uh, temporal um, scopes of of climate it's interesting that the very long term uh, trends of, of of the climate are easier to predict than than middle uh, ones so uh, if you see in this graph the our capacity to predict climate is still relatively low so uh, be very careful when you trust that uh, the climate in the future is going to be in this way or in that way uh, we can we can uh, foresee the tendency of change but uh, a precise prediction of how the, uh, the climate is going to be is not that that easy and not that uh, certain um, the way the, the atmospheric and climate scientists make these predictions is uh, using models very complex uh, models and uh, thanks uh, to to this modeling uh, advances and efforts is that we can capture the signal of of climate of how climate is changing and also very important on how uh, or how much the uh, human influence in this uh, climate change and variability and this is mainly because uh, there is a relationship uh, between the carbon dioxide accumulation in the atmosphere and uh, an increase in, in temperature. This is something very, very uh, criticized, and uh, many scientists think that this uh, relation relationship, in the first place, is not casual. In other words, that uh, an increase in carbon dioxide uh, do not cause an increase in temperature and that another controversial point is that uh, this uh, relationship is not that uh, that tight and, and that direct so uh, because uh, climate is so variable and uh, the in in the latest years carbon dioxide uh, accumulation in the, in the atmosphere has been exponential there is some uh, mismatches between the increase of concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and temperature but if we see this pattern in the long 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 term we can see that there is there is a general match between the behavior of, of uh, the carbon dioxide and the temperature so uh, thanks to this relationship or based on this relationship is that uh, as atmospheric uh, scientists have developed uh, different emission and concentration uh, scenarios this means that uh, here in this graph you can see that we have a historical uh, historical observations of aim of uh, carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere and based on this uh, behavior and these trends scientists 
have a projected different scenarios, which are these uh, fine uh, color lines. As you can see, these uh, trajectories or pathways are hundreds of them, and each one of them represents one possible uh, trajectory of, of emissions. And uh, this trajectory or, or these uh, pathways of, of emission will bring a scenario of accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, the IPCC took some representative concentration pathways, the famous RCPs, uh, to represent different uh, different uh, views of how the the atmosphere would look like at the end of the 20th 21st century uh, if we continue to to uh, produce emissions in the way we have historically doing we will have a, a very um, extreme pathway and a very high concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the end of the century. This is uh, the RCP 8.5, which is the business as usual uh, view of the world. If we uh, take some mitigation measures, we can we can uh, reduce our uh, emission rate and at the end uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide to different levels and this is what uh, scientists are trying to explain to decision makers and the public that if we don't want to have this very large concentration of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere we need to to do um, worldwide efforts for mitigating this emission le emissions level levels uh, so the IPCC took different uh, concentration pathways that represent different uh, scenarios of, of uh, mitigation or not in other words of, of uh, behavior of the humankind with respect to the to the uh, atmosphere and uh, in this sense having these uh, concentration scenarios and given that relationship between carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases with with temperature uh, um, climate scientists have developed very complex models that uh, simulate the relationship of the atmosphere with the ocean and with uh, with uh, the land and with the ice to produce or to try to understand how this increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the first place and then how this uh, would impact temperature and then how temperature is going to affect the other climatic variables because when temperature changes everything messes up precipitation cloud cover uh, winds solar radiation everything changes so the whole climatic system changes when when this uh, warming occurs so based on these general circulation models or GCMs uh, 
climate scientists have produced climatic scenarios for the future. In other words, you can see these maps that represent the, the, the climate or some or different climatic variables in the future, like temperature in this case, like precipitation in this case. But uh, these, these scenarios, these climatic scenarios, are tied to the emission scenarios. So, uh, if you remember in the previous graph, we had hundreds of emission scenarios. So, we have potentially hundred, hundreds of uh, climatic scenarios too. So, as you can see, uh, this is this is not uh, something that we really know now. Which one of of those uh, potential scenar potential scenarios will occur in the future? It's something that we don't know. It will depend in in the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that accumulates in the atmosphere and. That's a consequence of many complex and twisted uh, social and economical factors. So, uh, the main message here is that uh, climate change is a very complex to topic and uh, the outcome of, of, of all this complexity is a huge uncertainty on how climate is going to be in the future. That's why I insist that you have to be very careful in believing or trusting these uh, scenarios and the use of these scenarios for uh, assessing climate change impacts in different aspects uh, because of this uncertainty. Okay, so the key lessons for this this section is uh, that you have to be very clear that climate projections are not predictions. They are likely scenarios and many of them, most of them, are equally likely and we don't know which one is going to be the closest to reality. Uh, also, it's important to understand that uh, they represent coarse scale patterns of, of the climatic variables. Uh, and I refer to coarse scale in terms both in, in sp spatial scale it's not fine grained. It's not. They are not uh, precise in terms of of uh, sp spatial scale, and uh, also they are coarse in in terms of uh, the climatic variable per se. It's. Uh, they model like uh, the generalities of the climatic variables. For example, uh, the mean temperature, or the maximum temperature, or the minimum temperature. But uh, it's very difficult to model extreme events. And if we think on what really affects species, is not the mean values of of uh, climate change or, or climatic variables change. It's the extreme values what, what matters. And those extreme values are the most difficult to, to capture with these models. And the, the third key lesson here is that uncertainty is still an important uh, issue in all this uh, uh, theme on, on climate change. Okay, well, this is uh, the very basics on, on the climate system and climate change. 
Now let me go to uh, also basic information on, on how climate and climate change affects uh, biodiversity or, or biota. Well, if you are used to reading uh, scientific papers using niche modeling for uh, climate change assessments, you probably are, are uh, already biased to one way of, of looking at, at, at this, uh, this whole phenomenon. Uh, when we work with uh, niche models and climate change, we normally express our results in, in maps. And we have a map of the potential distribution of the species in the present, for example, and then another map that represents the potential distribution of that species on the one of the many uh, climatic scenarios. And uh, we think, or we tend to think, that uh, the species, the species as if it's an entity, shifts from one place to another because climate has changed in in the term of I don't know 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, and uh, I don't know if you have stopped a little bit to think how the process actually happens because it's not that the species or the individuals or populations that conform or that form the species moves from one place to another and when we look at the map it's that uh, the sensation that we get from from looking at the map but uh, let's let's uh, think like biologists what happens when in one place the environmental conditions start to change and become uh, and start to become uh, more difficult for for a particular species what happens with those individuals well uh, it depends in the first place of, of the magnitude of, of that change and how important this particular variable is for this species or for uh, one of its uh, key resources. Probably the effects of, of the change in the climatic variables is not directly to, to the target species but it affects directly to another species to, on, on which this target species de depends upon. So, uh, let's go to the, to the ground level. When, when uh, conditions, conditions start to, to change, individuals start to, to perform differently. Uh, they uh, are not as uh, fit as they used to be and this reflects in different ways. They could be uh, in their health or they could be or it could be in, in their uh, reproduction rate, in their survival, in the production of offspring. Uh, if if these uh, harsh conditions continue over time, this will be reflected in the population because there will be more mortality and less uh, recruitment of individuals. So uh, population populations would start to to decline and. Uh, if this continues in time, such population could uh, become extinct. 
So it's very important to to understand that uh, climate change does not affect the species. It affects individuals and uh, that gets reflected in the populations and, and then we can see some patterns in, in, the, in the species. So uh, there are many ways in, in which uh, climate change affects uh, uh, individuals, populations and species. And it could be in uh, sp spatial altera alterations, like uh, in the distribution of species with ex expansions, con contractions or, or extinctions, but also in temporal alter alterations like, uh, like change in, in seasonality of, of events like reproduction, for example, migration, different ways. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and uh, when one species is affected, or one population of a species is affected, the interactions among species also get affected. So uh, there is all these uh, disruptions in the biotic uh, communities because. Uh, the effect on, on one species, the direct effect of climate in one species. And uh, if this species starts to, to, to decline, it will affect all the, the, the species that interact with, with this one, and so on. So uh, when a climate change occurs, there is a, a huge alteration of, of the ecological processes that occur in, in a place. Okay. Well, uh, and uh, how is this process? Okay. Well, e normally it happens that in some parts of the distribution of species conditions become become uh, difficult and there are some other places in which conditions become more favorable than, than it used to be so uh, in those places where conditions are are becoming harsh populations will start to, to decline and they may collapse. So they, 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 there will be uh, local extinctions. You can see in this, in this illustration here that this is called the trailing age. And those places in which uh, conditions become more favorable for, for the species, and if the individuals can disperse to those new conditions, and they can establish, then they, they can establish populations and uh, there would be a shift in the distribution of, of, of these species. So, uh, this process or these processes will produce some uh, geographic patterns that we can identify. One of them could be a range expansion. If conditions become favorable in, in, in under climatic changes and individuals can disperse to those uh, favorable conditions and uh, conditions in, in the original uh, range did not change too much or the species has this adaptation capacity, then the species will expand its, its distribution. That's one possibility. The second possibility is that uh, the species cannot adapt to the new conditions 
or is not pre-adapted to those conditions and it cannot uh, disperse to the new favorable conditions. So this in, in the longer term would uh, reduce the distribution of this species. And if this continues to happen uh, over time, this species could go extinct. This is the second possibility. And the third possibility is that the species has the mobility, the, the dispersal capacity to move from, from uh, to the new conditions. And if it cannot adapt to the, to the harsh conditions, it will go extinct in one part of its distribution, but it would colonize uh, another areas. So this would uh, be observed as a range shift. And this is what we can see when we uh, model the distribution or the potential distribution of species, these, uh, these uh, geographic patterns. But what makes a species to respond in one way or in, a, in another way? Or in, in, the, in the first place is uh, the direction and the magnitude of the environmental change in relation to the niche of the species. So here in this illustration you can see two graphs. Let's uh, say that this is this is uh, the fundamental niche of a species uh, represented with this uh, ellipse here and these gray dots is the uh, environmental conditions of temperature and precipitation. When, when climate changes, what happens is that the, these uh, gray dots, background dots, the climate uh, where the species lives, move uh, in, a different, in, in different directions. In this case, uh, you can see that these low precipitation conditions disappeared and uh, the temperature became cooler here. So uh, if you see the relative position of the niche of the species, this circle here, with respect to, to the climate, you can see that most of the favorable conditions for this species disappeared. So we can think that uh, this species is not going to have a good time with this environmental change. Well, uh, another element that uh, determines how the species will respond to, to these climatic changes is its capacity to, to disperse or to, to colonize uh, these new environments that, that become favorable. And it's not only a matter of, of its capacity to, to disperse, it it also has to do with uh, how is the geography in, in that area, if there are important uh, geographic barriers for their dispersion and, and uh, things like that. Um, and uh, also the speed of the leading edge and the trailing edge are, are different. For some species, they are good dispersers and, and colonization is faster than, than the extinction process. And for others, it's the other way around. So, it's not, uh, there's not a general rule that the leading edge is, is slower or faster. Okay, well, the key lessons regarding this brief uh, introduction or, or reminding, reminder of, of 
climate change biology is that the responses of, of the species to, to climate change is also a very complex process that produces different uh, patterns, geographic patterns. And uh, this response depends on the intrinsic characteristics of the species, such as their dispersal capacity and uh, the reproduction rate and things like that and uh, the direction and magnitude of, of the of the environmental change the characteristics of the geographic and the environmental space and also the the, uh, the uh, community of the biotic uh, interactions with other species uh, may uh, reduce the possibilities of species to, to um, occupy new spaces or can accelerate the process of, of local extinction when, when important uh, species that interact with are, are uh, strongly affected by, by climatic changes. So as you can see, there are many angles uh, for the responses of, of species to, to these climatic changes. Okay. Well, uh, finally, I want to talk about how ecological niche model is used for addressing or for investigating this uh, climate uh, change topic and its impact to, to biodiversity. Well, uh, just I, I'm sure many, many of you that uh, are participating in this course have some experience with uh, modeling. Probably many of you don't. And uh, many of you have, for sure, um, some experience with uh, using niche models for climate change studies. So I'm going to refresh you what is the very basic process of, of modeling. Uh, distributions, potential distributions and uh, niches in the face of climate change. We start here, we have uh, a collection of, of uh, occurrence records for one species and uh, a collection of environmental variables that we know or that we suspect are uh, important to determine the, the potential distribution or conform the axis of the ecological niche of, of this species. And we have another collection of the same variables, but for a different uh, climatic scenario. This could be a future climate scenario, like in this example, but it could also be a past climatic scenario. So uh, what we do is that we model in the, in the present time or in the same time that we have our collection of points and environmental variables to characterize in the best way possible the ecological niche of the species. Well, here, be careful, because I have seen many times for uh, beginners that if, because they, they are interested in, in uh, looking at how climate change could affect the distribution of a species in the future, use this collection of points with these future climatic scenarios, and that's a big mistake, okay? So never do that. There is another, another basic uh, rule here. 
when you model uh, for projecting the niche model to a different uh, scenario, climatic scenario, you don't, you never have to use uh, the altitude as one of these uh, environmental variables. And this is because, uh, as you know, there is a relationship between temperature and elevation. The higher the elevation, the lower the temperature. And this relationship breaks down under a warmer uh, world in the future, in this case, because uh, the elevation will be the same, but at the same elevation, the, the, the temperature is going to be different. So this uh, makes everything to, to break down. So as, as a rule, when you do uh, models or when you use model niche models for projecting or transferring models uh, to different climatic scenarios, never use uh, elevation. Okay. Well, one, once you have made your best effort to model the, the distribution of the species in the present in the present time here, represented here by this uh, uh, group of, of points, you uh, project this niche model to the geography, back to the geography, and you produce a potential distribution of the species in the geographic space. And this same uh, niche model that you produce with the relationship of these variables with its, with the with the, these points project them to the alternative climatic scenario in this case this future climate scenario and you will produce a potential distribution map of the species under these climatic conditions okay and uh, it is very common to think that what you are doing with this, you have two maps here, a representation of the potential distribution of the species for the present and the representation of the potential distribution of the species for the future, this, this green uh, polygon here. You, you are tempted to, to think that uh, the species will shift to the north, for example, in this case, or that the, the populations in the, in the south, southernmost distribution of the species will uh, go extinct because uh, the conditions changed too much. And it's it's very common to see these kind of conclusions from this, this type of studies. Species X will lose X and X percentage of its range by 2050, for example. Species Y will gain much and much uh, square kilometers by 2080. Or um, by 20-something, Species Z will go extinct, extinct. Uh, or we should, as a recommendation, we should uh, create a new protected area in this uh, other region in which the models predict that the species will, will uh, persist in the future. And here I put you an example of this kind of, of uh, analysis and conclusions. This is an example of my own research, so I'm not going to, to blame anybody else. But I honestly think that this is totally wrong. Because uh, niche models cannot predict the fate of a species uh, in 
the first place because we are not modeling the distribution of the species. We are modeling the distributions of the conditions for the species uh, can survive according to our model, to our uh, occurrence records and the environmental variables that we are including. But there are much, ma many, many other elements that we are not considering. So uh, it is very risky to draw so such conclusions from an analysis like this. I am convinced that uh, niche models don't have this capacity and this is what we overreact or uh, uh, oversell the capacities of, of niche models. Well, uh, we need to understand what uh, these capacities are, what are the riches of, of this approach and what are its uh, limitations. So let's start with, uh, with uh, the, the very basic and important information that we need to understand uh, in order to, to know what, what are we doing with, uh, with, this, with these models. First of all, uh, we have to understand that there is no evolution involved in, in, this, in this modeling. In real life, species may adapt, may, may evolve, may have uh, genetic changes because of uh, environmental pressures uh, as a consequence of climate change. But we cannot account for that in, in niche models. These models are static in terms of evolution. And uh, there is a beautiful example. Let me go to another presentation because in this software I couldn't upload it. No, wrong direction. Um, here. I stole this, this uh, illustration from Jorge Soberon. I hope he doesn't get upset at me. But uh, what you see here is in your left uh, hand panel the representation of uh, the, the fundamental niche of this species, Atilocapra americana, which is the pronghorn. Uh, you, you see in here, in blue or purple, an ellipse here that represents the niche of of this species. You see in yellow the available environments within the fundamental niche of this species. And in black you can see the, the combination of these three environmental variables here as they change uh, through time. So this is a simulation of uh, an environmental change, a climate change. This is minimum temperature, this is maximum temperature, and this is precipitation. A long time. It doesn't really matter in this case if it's from the past to the present or from the present to the future. Uh, the idea here is to, to illustrate that uh, what changes is climate whereas the ecological niche of the species remain, uh, remains fixed. And how this is reflected in, in the geography. You can see in each one of these temporal steps how the distribution, the potential distribution changes because of these changes in the environment, but not because of any change 
in the uh, ecological niche of the species. Okay, I'm going back to the presentation. Another assumption is that uh, the relationship of the species with environmental variables that we can see in this response course remain, uh, remains constant uh, uh, a long time. In other words, it means that because we are generating the model in the present time and then project this niche model to a different scenario, the way in which the model describes the, the, the relationship of, of the occurrence records with the environmental variables is the same for the two time periods. And in, in real life, it, it may be different when uh, there is interaction between, uh, between the variables that changes uh, in, in, in a climatic change. And, and these uh, interactions uh, between the variables and how the species respond to these changes is something that is not uh, considered in, in, this, uh, in, in this way of, of modeling. So, uh, this brings several limitations of, uh, of the niche models to anticipate climate change impacts to biodiversity. In the first place, well, uh, niche modeling is a static approach and we want to model a dynamic process. So, the way we represent this dynamic process is, is in the form of, of temporal pictures. We have a picture of the, of the potential distribution of the species in the present time, and then we have another picture of the potential distribution of the species in a different time on, under a different climatic scenario, and so on. We, we can have several of those. Uh, but we have, uh, we do not understand or we do not explain uh, the process behind these these differences between one one picture and the other picture, and this is not a, capa a capability of this type of models of these correlative models. We need a different type of models mechanistic models or process-based models which can handle information that explains how the species uh, respond to these environmental changes. Second, the biotic interactions are not taken into account generally. It's, uh, it's a big uh, issue in Niche, in the niche modeling uh, world, how to incorporate biotic in, in interactions. And there are some advances, but uh, there is uh, still a lot of, of gaps in our knowledge and, and, and the ways we can, we can implement this. And I'm sure that in other sessions, uh, this is going to be a topic of, of in-depth uh, reflection and discussion. Of course, it ignores uh, the history of, of the species and uh, its evolutionary capacity and uh, genetic diversity, for example. So it cannot account for, for uh, uh, adaptation and evolution. Uh, There is uh, this uh, important issue on validation. When we make uh, projections to the future, well, almost by definition, it's impossible to validate that model. We don't know if, if uh, the potential distribution that we are obtaining for 2050 or 2080 it's going to be like that in reality. And we will have to wait 30 years or 50 years from now to know that. 
of course that makes no sense but it's it is very important to figure out some way of uh, of uh, if not validating the results to to have an idea if the results that we are obtaining are sensible make some sense and uh, in this case uh, there are different strategies to do so i will uh, explain you briefly one of them and this is part of a study that of, of one of my students that it's uh, we already sent this for publication and it's in the process, we don't know when this is going to, to be out. But uh, because we cannot validate in the future, we need to, to do it in a different way. And in, uh, one, one way of doing this is, is using a retrospective approach, which means that uh, instead of, of, of going to the future, we go to the past or from the past to the present when we have uh, data for doing uh, validation i'm i'm not going to explain this in depth it's it's only to give you the idea to illustrate you the idea but in this case we had uh, information in three periods in the 20th century climatic information for these three periods and uh, from early uh, 20th century, mid 20th century, and from, from the end of the 20th century. And we have uh, occurrence points for these mammal species for the three periods. Okay? So what we did here was uh, like a cross validation we used information from the first period and projected it to the second period and then validated uh, the model with uh, the points from the second period and then we did it in the other direction from the second period to the first period and the, we did the same for the first period to the third period and to the second period we did all the combinations possible and uh, because sample size is different for each one of the periods this is a, a, a problem because we don't know if the models were different because of the sample size or because they are responding to, to the variation of, of the climate so we did several uh, tests here using points from the, from the first period with uh, climates from the second period and using points from the second period and the climates of the second period and compare the maps to see if sample size is, is uh, having an effect and things like that. Well, we did this with three different algorithms and uh, what we obtained at the end is that, well, something that we already knew that the algorithms perform different but something that surprised us is that the same algorithm perform different if, if you do projections to the future than if you do projections to the past so this is uh, another uh, another element of complications for doing uh, this uh, climate change projections so the whole lesson of this exercise that i am presenting you here is that uh, not all species not all the species are uh, candidates for for modeling in the present and in a different uh, climate scenario it depends on the the number and the quality of of the occurring records for producing a good model in the present and then being able to project it into a, a future or a past uh, scenario well this is one way of uh, evaluating if if projections are having sense 
what we did is that for those species that uh, we obtain robust results in this cross validation we projected those those species to future conditions with more confidence and another way of 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 um, knowing if if our uh, projections are are having are making sense is to do field work uh, if 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 you have uh, areas in which you expect that the species is going to to have a bad time and some other areas in which you expect that the species is going to do fine you can go and measure some traits of the species it could be abundance it could be fitness it could be something that reflects if the if, if the individuals in that population uh, is happy or is not happy and that's another way of of uh, of evaluating if uh, projections are are good or are make, making sense at least uh, then there is a, another let me go back if i can go back yeah there is another limitation a very important limitation of 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 this uh, uh, ecological niche modeling approach to to anticipate uh, yeah, impacts to biodiversity by climate change and its uh, its uncertainty. There are uh, let me go forward again. Different sources of uncertainty that uh, make difficult to um, to believe that the results are precise in different ways let me explain myself uh, first of all do you remember that i told you that there are hundreds hundreds of scenarios even even when we biologists and, and ecological niche modeling users know only a bunch of, of them, these are only one part of many, many more uh, scenarios that exist out there. So uh, <coughs> there's a huge... Uh, amount of of uh, possibilities for for generating scenarios and generating potential distributions of, of a species for, for the future it's not only that there are many rcps but there is also many gcms in other words for for the same RCP, for example, 8.5. There are many laboratories in the world that have produced different uh, general circulation models for that uh, uh, representative pathway. So uh, the amount of possibilities for creating or for generating uh, potential distributions for future scenarios is pretty high and of course this uh, variation produces different different uh, distributional scenarios for the species and which one is is closer to reality we don't know and we cannot know there are many in, or not many but there are some uh, statistical treatments for for uncertainty for this type of uncertainty and one of them is the the use of of uh, model and ensembles or ensembles which which means that you have to do many different uh, models for different scenarios 
and different GCMs and then you you ensemble them using different rules and there is a whole field of, of uh, how to ensemble or how to assemble uh, models, niche models actually uh, there is one of the implementations for for of the software in R for making uh, niche models. It's uh, inspired in this whole idea of, of making scenarios. It's called Bioensamples by Miguel Araujo and BioMode. It's also another one that it's uh, very strong in in this uh, uh, scenario building. And this is made, this was made by by Wilfried uh, three three years. Well, another source of uncertainty is uh, these uh, many algorithms that we use for for generating niche models. Uh, the the most popular one is Maxent, but there are many other algorithms that have been used and are used for for uh, generating models and uh, this illustration shows you how uh, how these algorithms may may uh, produce very different results for the same set of data for the same species under the same climatic scenarios the only thing that that we varied here in this in this uh, exercise was the algorithm and you can see that if when you when, when we used uh, a gleam the potential distribution for the species in the future showed an expansion whereas when we used uh, a genetic algorithm here it uh, it uh, showed the opposite behavior instead of expanding its its distribution its actual distribution which is this one it reduce its, its distribution so this is a very critical problem because uh, we can say that uh, the fate of the species depends on the algorithm that you use to model it and that's a terrible problem so uh, we have an idea of why this is occurring but uh, uh, it's important that you know that depending on the algorithm that you use your results are going to be different and uh, here says two but it's three uh, another source of uncertainty is what it's called the non-analog uh, climates, which uh, that means that uh, let's say that in the in the future, because uh, temperature is is increasing and precipitation and the other climatic variables are uh, being altered, uh, there will be new combination of, of climates that they do not exist currently new combinations of, of temperatures with precipitation for example that do not exist now so uh, how can we know if a species is going to tolerate these new combinations if, if there is no way to calibrate that in the present. That's the problem of the non-analog uh, climates. And uh, how, not only how the species is going to respond to non-analog climates, but also how um, the algorithms handle this problem. And well, it depends on the way it is uh, programmed. So um, unless you know how the, the algorithm works and how it works in terms of extrapolating to different climatic conditions or not, it's, uh, it's the way that you can interpret your, your results in, in a better way. Uh, there, are, there are also um, some statistical procedures to evaluate 
if if in the in the region there are uh, non-analog climates in two different scenarios uh, one of them is implemented in the Maxen software and it's the, the method is called MESS multivariate environmental suitability surfaces I think it's 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 the meaning and uh, Town and his colleagues have developed a, a different one which uh, we will review when when we do the practices which is uh, the MOP analysis but the two of them are designed to to evaluate in the geography in other words it's, it's a map that shows you in what pixels you you find uh, non-analog climates <coughs> okay well probably until now I have been somewhat uh, skeptic or negative or pessimistic regarding the capabilities of of ecological niche models to predict I don't like that word but uh, to anticipate how species will respond to climate change but honestly I'm not I'm not uh, pessimistic I'm actually I'm very happy but I want you to be realistic on what are the limitations and the reaches of, of, of nature models but there are good news because uh, there is evidence not from ecological niche models but for from observational data that species do track their their uh, niches or at least they they uh, respond to uh, some environmental variables in the way that one would expect <coughs> this has been observed in birds this has been observed partially in mammals and and also in, in amphibians there are three examples here and if not all species respond in the way one would expect many species do so there is a uh, th there is a usefulness of of, uh, of this approach for uh, capturing the signal of, of the species respond to the environmental change there is evidence that niche models work uh, mainly in in, in long-term studies in comparisons between the Pleistocene and the present for example and there are several examples in which we can uh, capture this signal of, of uh, distributional change uh, correctly predicting the distribution of, of a species in the past or from the past to the present and uh, there is a lot of people working in this topic so I'm very smart people working on, on this so uh, uh, methods and uh, approaches and processes are improving fast and in and the same at the same time many more data mm, occurrence data ecological data genetic data environmental data is becoming available so we can make more a more a comprehensive and more uh, integrative analysis so uh, I think the the future of, of uh, this field is still very wide very open and there are many many opportunities to investigate and to improve our current uh, practices but well I want to give you just to finish some basic guidelines of what you you should pay attention to when when you want to do this or use this ecological niche modeling for uh, uh, climate change studies well the first thing that you have to keep in mind is that you don't 
have to expect or demand more from the niche models that they can do. Uh, they will not tell you what uh, is going to be the fate of a species in the future. Uh, it's not uh, a magic ball. It's uh, only an approach, very simple in terms of, of its concept. It's a correlational uh, approach with several limitations. So uh, don't think that you will predict what will happen to, a, to a species in the future. <coughs> As I mentioned you, not all species are good candidates for modeling under climate change. There are uh, several issues in terms of the occurrence data, the spatial resolution, the VAM configurations or the Eltonian noise that uh, makes it difficult for for some species or some areas to to get good predictions or good projections in, in, in the distribution of, uh, under different scenarios well the some uh, mandatory uh, procedures here are that you have to do a very good characterization of the niche in the present for being able to project it in the future. If you cannot get a good model for the present, don't even try to, to project it to another environmental scenario or not another climatic scenario to the future or to the past. Because all the small errors and, and uh, deficiencies of uh, the niche models when you produce them in the present uh, get exacerbated when you, you project them into the future. You need to do a good adequate variable selection, for example. If you use too many variables, then you uh, um, let me think how how can I explain this uh, you you are artificially creating many many environmental combinations that will be difficult to find in a future scenario for example so you what you will see is normally a reduction of the potential distribution of the species which is an artifact a methodological artifact and is not Part of the response of the species for example <coughs> so you need to do a, a very robust calibration with a rigorous validation in the present in order to be able to project it to the different scenario uh, you need to 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 be conscious and to do something regarding the uncertainty which is is the main uh, the main weakness I would say because there are many sources of uncertainty. So uh, it's important that, that you don't keep only one scenario in the future, one one GCM in the future, for example, and only one algorithm, thinking that this is going to to do all the work. Uh, it is much better always to use different climatic scenarios and uh, see different possibilities of, of potential distribution of the species and also to use different algorithms to see if there is consistency among them or not. And also to do these evaluations with the non-analog climates. And finally, uh, uh, try to do some, some type of validation of your transferences. For the past, you can use uh, fossil records or depends if it's a long-term uh, study or if it's the recent past, you can use old uh, uh, occurrences or genetic information, for example. <coughs> and if you don't have any of that, 
and you have the possibility to do field work in the way I, I just told you, it's, it's always important to, to have some reference if your models are, are, are making sense of not, because it's very, very easy to produce models to the future and because there's no way to validate that, you can say whatever you want and uh, uh, people may buy your idea or not but uh, but i think that's not uh, that's not that's not useful it doesn't uh, we don't learn anything from from doing that so it's important to try to to make sense of of the models and uh, well that's it i just want to to end of my participation with three conclusions uh, please don't think that making models in the context of climate change is something easy it's very easy to to do it technically with your hands and with your software and your data you can produce hundreds of maps but that's not the point the point is to think what you are doing and what you are getting from doing in the way you, you did your, your processes. So you need not only to be, be capable with uh, the techniques, you have to be knowledgeable about your system that you are studying, the species that you are studying, the interactions that such species has with another species and if you can incorporate that into the modeling or after the modeling is in a post-processing you have to know some some basic ecology of your species some demography or some dispersal capacities for example you have to know very well your data if your uh, occurrence data or the occurrence data for your species is reliable the sources of them how, how big could be the the error associated or the uncertainty associated to those records and uh, you uh, it's 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 uh, convenient very convenient that you know the region where you are uh, doing your projections and understand how climate works there and how as, as far as you can how has been the history of the climate there and how are the trajectories of change and uh, of course you have to know about modeling we normally don't understand what an algorithm is doing it's a black box for many of us uh, please don't Please try to understand what uh, the statistical or mathematical manipulation uh, the algorithm is doing with your with your data. And uh, I think the this the strength of, of this approach is in its capacity to detect uh, general trends more than specific things like, for example, this species is going extinct in 20 years or we need to to put a, a new reserve in this area because the species is going to to be there in, in 30 years i think that's the kind of questions that we cannot answer with this approach but we can we do we we are able to to identify or to detect uh, more general patterns of change for example if the if the if the tendency of the species is to to move to one direction <coughs> that's the kind of things that that we can we can do with with this approach so my invitation is that you be a, a a thoughtful user of, of this and not only a mechanical user of, of these methods. Well, uh, I think that's all what I have uh, to say. Probably this is a long presentation, but I, 
there's many many more things to say about this and this is just an introductory talk well i expect you your questions and i hope i can give answers to many of them and with my my colleagues uh, have a good day